This is the Comics Alternative Manga, reviews of Queen Emeraldus, Volume 1, and Otherworld Barbara, Volume 1. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Manga. I'm Derek. And I'm Shay. And we're two guys talking about manga. And on this month's episode, we're going to be looking at two recent works. We're going to begin with Laiji Matsumoto's Queen Emeraldus, Volume 1. After that, we're going to turn to the first book of Otherworld Barbara by Moto Hagio. But before we get to those titles, we want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Manga is brought to you by their great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, including September, you're going to find some great specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off the cover price, sometimes at 50% off cover. But often, you can find discounts that are more impressive than that. Like this month, you can get uh, copies of the manga adaptation of the the Jane Austen novel Emma for 25% off and you can get volumes of Bakuman which we have talked about on the show Mm -hmm. um, for 30% off that's right so whether your tastes go toward manga or other kind of comics you can't go wrong by visiting the website of the sponsor Discount Comic Book Service that's right go to dcbservice.com they'll take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs and after you do get your manga there Please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Shay and Derek sent you. So, Shay, how have things been going in your world? Oh, they've been pretty good. Like I was telling you before we uh, started recording, I am going out of town this week. So it's it's beginning of a a pretty hectic week. But other than that, uh, everything is going going pretty normal. Uh, What about you? I know you've uh, you've started the, the new semester since I think since we last spoke. Yeah, well, I think we had just started the tail, uh, the, the very beginning of mm-hmm. the fall semester, but it, it's going well. It's going well. Um, you know, still uh, very busy, not only with school stuff, but also with the podcast material and my own writing. But uh, it, it, everything's keeping me busy. Well, could be worse. You could have nothing to do. That's true. Although sometimes that does seem an attractive <laughs> option. That's true. That's fair. Yeah. Well, I'm glad when I ask what was going on in your world, you didn't say that it is very much like the world of Barbara. Yes, that would be uh, confusing and uh, upsetting. Right. Now, if our listeners are wondering <laughs> you know, what the crap I'm talking about, well, keep listening to this episode, and we will tell you about Otherworld Barbara. <laughs> And and on that topic, Shay, let's go ahead and jump into this month's books. All right. Yeah, the first uh, title that we're going to look at is Queen Emeraldus. This is the first volume of what I think is going to be four volumes from Kodansha Comics. Is that correct? Um, I think it's actually going to be two. I know the it was originally four, but I I think Kodan or Kodanshas are the. Uh, they're two put together, um, but I could be wrong about that. Okay, um, but this is definitely the first of, yeah. of at least two volumes, and this is written and drawn by Laiji Matsumoto. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this is the first time that I've read any of Matsumoto's work. Have Have you read his his manga in the past? Um, I actually have not. Uh, they are famous. He's he's. A pretty well-known name in, in America, I think, by um, by certain anime fans. But his work has been very uh, sparsely translated, I would say. I, I, I think this is the first 
uh, Matsumoto work of any kind to get any sort of translation in in at least a couple decades. Um, but I think he people primarily know him for um, stuff like his work on like Galaxy Express 999 or the Space Battleship Yamato uh, anime. Right. Yeah, I knew that he was known for his space operas, like, you know, you mentioned Space Battleship Yamato, Galaxy Express 999, mm-hmm. and then Space Pirate, Captain Harlock. But from what I found out from digging around, it, he's known, at least in this country, primarily through anime, not mm-hmm. manga. And so I don't know if Queen Emeraldus is the first English translation of his work, but it's definitely probably the only – translation that's that's in print yeah yeah it's i think there was you know a couple um volumes of maybe uh space battleship yamato or galaxy express uh, no maybe galaxy express was just a there's a there's i think there was a couple volumes of something that that some publisher uh managed to get the license to in like the mid to late 80s -hmm. um but yeah it's it's definitely the only one of his work that's still in print certainly Mm -hmm. now we should mention uh matsumoto is still alive uh but this book queen emeraldus uh was or the series was originally appearing in the weekly shonen magazine between 1978 and 1979 and in fact when you pick up this first volume and open it up I think one of the first things that manga fans will notice is that the art definitely does not look like something they would find in more contemporary examples of manga. Oh no, that's uh, that is one thing that um, that really struck me about this work is that Matsumoto, uh, the way he draws uh, and the kind of space opera stories that he 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 likes to tell definitely have this kind of quintessentially. 80s or not in the 80s 70s um like anime look to them um that you know it that it's it's definitely definitely a product of its time and and that was actually one of the things that that i really enjoyed most about about this first volume what was the the art yeah you know he draws these uh, these huge bulky uh, spaceships that you know sometimes look like blimps, and uh, you know his 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 women are super lithe, and they have these very very long kind of extremities and and, and bodies, and uh, his his male characters are very fat and circular, and um, you know it just struck me as as being the kind of epitome of what you know when I think of seventies of manga or seventies anime, just the way that some that stuff looks. Uh, Matsumoto's work. Here, it, it definitely is the kind of epitome of, of that look. Mm-hmm. You know, I hadn't thought of this until just now when you were mentioning the look of the, the 1970s. I wonder how much, if any, influence here we have with heavy metal. Um, that is interesting because he does uh, – he, he would have been doing you know this work in particular uh, around – the time that that the French French uh, original version of heavy metal right. uh, was was kind of first starting out, and there was a kind of shared aesthetic, I would say. But I don't know if if I don't know if, if Matsumoto's work uh, looks particularly influenced by that work. You know, they're they're kind of function in the same sort of way, but. I, there's a there's a there's kind of a visual connection there that I, that uh, that I didn't pick up on that I that now that you mentioned it I do do kind of see, but I would I would be interested as well to see kind of what uh, what he was reading at this time and and if he did have if he was you know maybe getting copies of that that French magazine. Yeah, because in terms of if not so much the art, then I guess the subject matter definitely, and also the way that. Um, Matsumoto draws one of the two protagonists, uh, Emeraldus. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just strikes me as someone that you could find out of, you know, the original heavy metal. It, it just has that feel to it, and also mm-hmm. uh, the ve- the very detailed spaceships. The mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it, it, uh, there, there's a couple spaceships in particular that that definitely look. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that Matsumoto draws like a, like a Philippe Droulet. Uh, or like a Kaza, um, but there was a couple spaceships that do have that kind of 
that weird H.R. Giger kind of biomechanical look to them in, in a couple of spots. So I, I definitely... I definitely see what you're what you're talking about. Mm. So uh, I, I I think Matsumoto's work has has far too little uh, sex for it to be uh, to right. have appeared in in, in those uh, those early heavy metals. Right. Oh, there, there, there's none here. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a it's there's a very, violence. Uh, oh, certainly, certainly, it's a it's a it's a very uh, chast book. Uh, but even the violence, you know, there's. Uh, you know, there is there is that certainly, and, and it, it's a lot, and it's um, it's foregrounded, but uh, but my, even even that, it, it's very uh, it's very clinical almost. You know, the way the way that Matsumoto draws violence, and the way that his characters uh, engage with violence and uh, react to violence, it's very much like uh, you know they're just just doing their duty. You know, it's not something they they kind of derive any sort of emotional response from right and in fact throughout the this first volume there's uh, uh the mention of the code of outer space mm-hmm. in one form or another and this is um and it, it is what em- emeraldus tells the other protagonist hiroshi umino and but she's not the only one to talk about the code of outer space. Other characters do this as well, mm-hmm. and, and I mean there there are different facets to to the code. But it it just strikes me as something similar to what we see in other genres, right? Where we have codes in terms of westerns, we also have a code in terms of let's say crime or noir. You know, there's just mm-hmm. certain things that you do and certain things that you don't do. Uh, now, um, when when there's violence involved in this book, it's I like the way that you put it. It's it's very clinical. It's done without weighing the emotional um, impact one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just something that needs to be done. And I know that there is quite a bit of a cultural difference between the United States and Japan. But being uh, you know a, a reader in the United States in the year 2016. I couldn't help but think that the way that violence is handled in this book is just something that we don't find anymore, at least in material, comics and otherwise, produced in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, like I said, I, I'm not super familiar with um, Matsumoto's other work. I, I don't think I've seen any of the, the anime that he's you know written. Uh, you know, I've seen the, the kind of Daft Punk music videos that he's he's worked on, but. Um, so I'm not I'm not super familiar if this is if this is something that kind of recurs throughout his work, but um, I know uh, Joe McCullough on an episode of Comic Books Are Burning Hell. They they talked about in this book, and um, he makes the point that these characters and that Matsumoto's work uh, is heavily influenced by like Bushido and these these kind of older uh, Japanese ethical codes. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the you know the code of space uh, is is a substitute for that where you know there's a there's a kind of disdain for authority figures, um, but at the same time it's not kind of an an anarchic world. It's a, it's very much a rule based, um, codified ethical system that that he kind of privileges, but it's it's one that that prioritizes the individual and and the, you know the individual has to make his way in the world. And uh, and so it, it is. I, I don't know if it's a if it's a particularly Japanese way of depicting violence, but it, it does seem to stem from from Masumoto's ethos that is, you know, very. Um, uh, it's very black and white, very binary, and it's based mm-hmm. on this this uh, ethical system that, that you or I may think is is very strange or weird um, but it does it does seem particular to to Matsumoto's work um, right. and, and it gives it gives uh, it gives this book in particular a very it makes it very interesting to read. Right. Well, let's let's talk a bit about uh, the book's premise, right, and what goes on in this first volume. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Queen Emeraldus. This first volume is very episodic in nature. You know, mm-hmm. and you know this is reflected in the fact that it originally appeared in Weekly Shonen Magazine, right? So uh, the episodic uh, nature is, is definitely going to come out. Um, it, it, when I said earlier that we have two protagonists here. 
Um, I mean, I mean, just that, you know, I don't know who the main character is. Would it be the young boy Hiroshi or would it be Emeraldus? I think it's both. And when we are first introduced to this manga, we see Emeraldus, but we don't get to see much of her. But she Mm -hmm. does reveal there's something about this character, this young boy, Hiroshi, that draws her, that she feels connected to. Uh, and, and then we get some of Hiroshi's story. Now, Hiroshi lands on – is it? it's on Mars originally, correct? Yeah, in the first, in the first yeah. one he's on Mars. Right, and, and he constructs a spaceship on his own uh, from, I guess, whatever he can find from you know home, uh, which mm-hmm. is Earth. And he, uh, he manages to get to Mars. And so that's when we're first introduced to him, and we learn that he's someone who is very much like you were describing a moment ago, kind of a a singular figure, right? An outsider, someone who's very much an individual. This is not the kind of guy who would be part of any kind of group or duo. I mean, he does things on his own. I mean, he he accepts the friendship and the help every now and again of other individuals. I mean, it's not like he's, you know, repulsed by other people. Uh, But this is a guy who likes to do it on his own and to do it his way, right? Because he Mm -hmm. has to prove something to himself. So throughout this first volume, he is wanting to construct his own spaceship in order to travel and be his own man. Mm -hmm. And so that's the side of Hiroshi that Emeraldus is very much drawn to. Now, whereas at first we don't get much of her story, as this first volume progresses, we get bits and pieces of her past. In other words, the exposition is filled in little by little. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we find out how she became this space pirate, which I Mm -hmm. guess guess she is, uh, that that she has become. Uh, She used to be someone who we learn, as as the book continues, who you know, was a little weak, gullible, innocent, but through, I guess you could say in a cliche way, the school of hard knocks, she's learned her lessons. And in fact, you can see the lessons, she points this out, uh, by the scar on her face. There's a scar on the left cheek of mm-hmm. her face. And we learn in this first volume how she got that scar. And the scar is the result of something that happened to her. I don't want to give too much away, but in instead of masking what would eventually become a scar – it was made into a scar by, by someone that she encountered in order for her to learn and to always remember mm-hmm. what she learned every time she looks in the mirror. So um, we learn a little more about Emeraldus as the book uh, unfolds. And in the episodic nature of this first volume, it, it basically goes back and forth between Hiroshi and Emeraldus, although the vast majority of the action that takes place, I think, involves Hiroshi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know uh, this this book in particular is weird, and, and I'm not entirely sure why Kodan chose to, to translate these uh, Queen Emeraldus volumes first, because this is a character who um, who did first appear, I think, in another Matsumoto series, and she's shown up in a couple others, and uh, so you know this is kind of like a spin off of a spin off, and. Um, so, you know, some readers who might be reading this may be more familiar with her backstory, but um yeah, she is she is this kind of enigmatic enigmatic figure that uh we kind of get hints of and it's it's very much an extension of of like I was saying earlier that kind of ethical code, you know, of of you know, you, you have to be strong and powerful, but you can only be strong and powerful by going out and, and making it on your own and and not accepting help and and uh, at one point, Hiroshi even encounters someone who, you know, is um, I can't God, I can't remember his name, but he's he's like working on on the perfect oh the, uh, the young guy yeah he's working on the perfect spaceship and he's designing it and Hiroshi's like no you can't you can't design it you know you have to go just build it and get out there even if it kills you even if it's it's imperfect and it explodes you have to get out there and and um, you know so this is definitely a book that's that's. That's at points almost not concerned with plot. It's about concerned with this this world with where you know you have to you have to get out and then just go and do it even if it even if you die in the in the sea of stars. <laughs> right. You know what what you just said makes sense. I see this first volume at least not so much anchored in plot as idea. 
right? Mm-hmm. So you have these competing ideas. Now you mentioned this young guy again. I can't remember his name either, um, but he he's brilliant. And he's great at designing ships, although he uses his skills at designing as an excuse in in many ways not to venture out into space because he says, I'll only go out when I have the perfect ship. Well, Mm -hmm. there's no way he'll ever build the perfect ship. And so he is in many ways the antithesis to Hiroshi who, as you pointed out, just does it, regardless of whether his ship is ready or not. And so we have mm-hmm. these two different worldviews of how to engage in life, right? I mean, do you mm-hmm. sit back until the time is right, or do you, do you just do something, and then you make the time right for whatever it is that you mm-hmm. wanted to do? Um, now, obviously, uh, Matsumoto seems to be siding with the Hiroshi side of that equation, mm-hmm. um, but that's just one example of the kind of ideas that are thrown out in this first volume. Uh, Emeraldus, you know, is an, is another vessel for these kind of ideas. Um, you know, there's the aforementioned code of outer space, and one of the things she tells Hiroshi fairly early on uh, mm-hmm. in their encounters is that w- when you have an opponent. Mm-hmm. And there is the possibility of killing, kill, you know, never wound, you know, mm-hmm. never let mercy get in the way, never let your emotions take over, you know, kill because they will come back to kill you if they can. And, you know, that is a very cold and rough philosophy, but it's one that seems to be woven throughout this first volume. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is, what is Hiroshi? She says something like, um, Better to be uh, a chicken's head than a cow's tail. Yeah, um, and uh, you know that's that's kind of his his philosophy, and uh, it, it leads to him crashing on uh, several planets. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, when I was when I was reading this book in particular, I was really reminded of um, Carol Clover's. Uh, study of of gender in horror movies, Men, Women, and Chainsaw, and um, because you know, like a lot of the books she or like a lot of the movies she talks about in that book, Queen Emerald. This is a very you know, it's a, it's a trashy, I would say, uh, manga. It's it's very it's kind of lurid. It's episodic. You know, it's not particularly uh, well written, I would say. Um, but at the same time, there is this kind of uh, aesthetic. Uh, beauty to too much of it you know i i was really drawn to the way matsumoto draws things and the way he draws space sometimes as these kind of blotches of kind of ink wash mm-hmm. and there, there is this kind of really rich uh conversation to be had about you know the kind of ethical codes and the arguments that that matsumoto is making through these otherwise rote or you know pallid uh stories and and so i was really struck by that the way that he is able to kind of work in uh, whether uh, intentionally or unintentionally these this really fascinating construction of of a system of ethics into the otherwise um very uh, ordinarily written uh, serial mm-hmm. right um, and then both characters hiroshi and emeraldus Wherever they go, they seem to bring justice, or at least their brand of justice, with them. Right. You know, um, there's a there's a scene where Emeraldus um, she goes to it's like a western planet almost, and mm-hmm. a a bounty hunter wants to get wants to kill her for the glory because she has this great reputation, but she kills him instead, and then you know forces the the town sheriff to pay out on the bounty, even though he wasn't going to because of the 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 criminal ended up being like an, an android, but then Emeraldus doesn't uh, take the money. She leaves it for Hiroshi, and she is kind of always coming into town and and doing the right thing for maybe the right reasons, maybe altruistic reasons, maybe reasons of her own, um, but doing the right thing, uh, helping people who cannot help themselves. At one point, she uh, oh. Uh, I can't remember the name of the planet, but she, you know, she goes to this planet and she rescues a kind of inter- an internment camp full of people who are who are there because they are physically imperfect because they don't fit some. Oh yes, this, that's right. Yeah, yeah. This this planet's ideals of beauty. So she's always swooping in and doing the right thing, and, and Hiroshi does that often too when he is given the opportunity. And so it's, it is these characters who who do kind of kill without without recourse and without really thinking about it. 
and um, you know, Emerald. This is is a pirate, but at the same time, they are often doing the right thing because it's they they do have a of a code. Right. Um, so uh, this is it's it's a really interesting book in that way because it is on its surface very kind of pulpy, but it's it's also it's also a really rich work, I think. Yeah. Um, now you know we've called this a, a space opera, but for this to take place in space with quite a bit of violence in places, this didn't seem like, I guess, an action-packed narrative to me. In other mm-hmm. words, um, it seemed to be relatively subdued. And I think one of the things that subdued the the, the narrative for me were those moments, and they're plentiful, where mm-hmm. we get kind of, uh, I don't want to say dreamy, but shadowy is probably a better way of putting it, uh, Emeraldus, who narrates, right, and makes mm-hmm. comments about what's going on, especially with the character Hiroshi. And these, I mean, it's not poetic, but it's something that attempts at a kind of poetry, right, the way of looking at life, the way of looking at uh, space exploration, and something that keeps coming up again and again and again, and not just from Emeraldus, but from other characters as well, and that is the sea of stars or the ocean of stars. And at, at times that waxing uh, poetically mm-hmm. um, or waxing poetic got on my nerves a little bit. It's like, okay, I've I've heard the phrase, you know, the sea of stars or the ocean of stars and – and, and what that means in the larger scheme of things and, mm-hmm. you know, the way that we navigate through life is like the way we navigate through the stars. And that's that's where, you know, Emeraldus's and, and Hiroshi's calling is and all of that. And I know that the reason why this seems to be repetitive is because, again, this is this was originally a serial narrative. So, you know, Matsumoto needed to drive that home uh, in, in, in an episodic way. Mm-hmm. However... Uh, as as a cohesive storyline, these momentary pauses that attempt at a kind of poetic speculation of life mm-hmm. made this a lower key adventure than I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. That's interesting, and, and that is something I wanted to mention to you because it is you know if anyone you know, picks up a copy of this and flips through it, they'll they'll notice that uh, unlike some most manga series, I think I think the only one other one that I've seen. That I, I've been aware of that has done this is um, Katsuhiro Otomo's Akira, which we've talked about on the show, mm-hmm. where um, you know it is it's a serialized um, story, but it doesn't it, it omits the chapter breaks, um, and so it you know this book and, and Akira it gives the impression of being a kind of sustained uh, narrative that was designed for you to be to to read straight through, but they don't omit those. Uh, those kind of recap pages that you talked about where Emeraldus, it's her face kind of against the sea of stars and it's it's her usual like, I am Queen Emeraldus and, you know, I am on a journey and I cannot tell you why and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, and, um, and so you know, it is something that kind of does, it does get very repetitive and it, 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 it shows up at very odd moments um, because, you know, you, you don't have that explicit, okay, one serial has ended or one episode has ended. The other one is about to begin, um, and so it, you know, it's they they omit one thing without omitting omitting the other, and so it is it is really like trying to read, uh, like sitting down and reading one of those fanographics, um, complete peanuts, or um, you know those one of those volumes of uh, the complete Calvin and Hobbes where they don't mm-hmm. omit the um, that one or two panels where they briefly kind of recapitulate the previous day's uh, strip. Um, you know, if you see, if anyone who's sat down and read, you know, a comic strip like that in, in one sitting, you know, it's it's very obvious that it wasn't designed to be read like that mm-hmm. because it does get very very repetitive because you don't have those, you know, that that day break between between strips where you need to be reminded and and so I definitely I definitely do feel similarly to you that uh, it does it does often show up at, at seemingly strange times and it it does get very does get very repetitive. <laughs> yeah, but it is an interesting book, and I, I, I couldn't help but think of another space exploration science fiction work that we discussed last year, and that was Yukimura's Planets. Mm-hmm. Uh, although that one was more, I would say, um, kind of a harder, more realistic science fiction than this one. Uh, mm-hmm. This is a little more on the Star Trek side. 
Yeah, it's it's Star Trek is a good one because Star Trek does feature um, Star Trek is is a it's a, it's a frontier narrative and it and it features right. many of the tropes of um, long running Western series and uh, so I hadn't, I hadn't thought of of comparing this to Star Trek but it does it does feature some, some of those same motifs that that people don't usually usually think of when they think of space opera but it does it does include. Um, it's a it's it's an it's an interesting book. I, I don't know if I've if I've quite read anything like Emeraldus. Yeah. Now I think, if I'm not mistaken, that we already have a pub date for the second volume. Maybe we don't. I'm looking at Amazon right now. Um, so I'm wondering when Kadansha is going to be coming out with volume two of Queen Emeraldus. That is a good question. I thought I had seen one, but I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't sure exactly when. When the second one was set to come out, but because another thing I'm wondering is if this is the first of maybe what Kadansha may be planning as uh, more translations of Matsumoto's works. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm you know here's hoping this is successful because, like I said, I'm a, I am a big fan of of the way Matsumoto draws. Mm-hmm. Uh, his use of ink washes is it's, it feels very contemporary um, in a way that that a lot of of what I've read of, of 70s manga or 70s American comics doesn't anymore. And I, I really love the way he draws people. And his, I think his go-to panel is, is these characters with, with very big hair and it's a close up of the people and you kind of get a delineation of the, the hairline, but the, the rest of the hair kind of bleeds into the white space or black space of the negative space of the panel. And it gives this, the impression of, this person's face being very, very wide, uh, and it's it's a very weird effect. But you know, stuff like that, I, I really enjoyed. So I, I would really like them to, to uh, to read more of Matsumoto's work in English. And uh, so I hope I hope Kodansha does you know does try and translate more of his stuff. So you want to move on to the second book that we're looking at this month? Uh, yeah, let's get into Otherworld Barbara. Yeah, so this is the first volume of Otherworld Barbara by Moto Hagio. This is coming out from Fantagraphics, and actually it's already come out. We didn't mention that Queen Esmer- Emeraldus Volume 1 came out in late July of this year, and Otherworld Barbara's pub date was in early August. So both of these volumes definitely available. They've been out for a little while. And this is the first of what I guess two volumes of this title. Yeah, I wasn't uh, I wasn't sure how how Fanographics was was publishing this. Yeah, but um, I know I did see copies of this when I was at Small Press Expo at the big Fanographics table the other weekend. Um, now, have you read any Hagio before? No, that was uh, you know I think I suggested we we do it on the the show because I, I she has this incredible reputation as being the kind of mother of uh, Jose manga and she has this incredible presence in uh, manga history and um, you know I've, I've seen some of her some of the art for the other series that Fanographics has published and so I've I've for a, for a while I've I've really been interested in in reading her stuff but. Um, I hadn't, and so I thought this would be a good opportunity to to get a copy and and to to get into it. Um, but I think you had actually read some of the other stuff that Fanographics had published of hers, right? Yeah, yeah. Now I'm I was familiar with the Heart of Thomas, and the Heart of Thomas is notable as I guess one of the early examples of Shonen I, uh, mm-hmm. you know, boy love, and. You know, reading that and then reading Otherworld Barbara, it, it's as if two different creators have worked mm-hmm. on those books. I mean, vastly different. I mean, the art definitely is is, is similar, of course, uh, but the kind of story that you have in Otherworld Barbara and the kind of story we have in The Heart of Thomas, very different. Um, Heart of Thomas, um, in terms of tone, strikes me as at times melodramatic. Quite mm-hmm. sentimental, um, and, and I think purposefully so, I mean, given its subject matter. 
um, you definitely would not be able to use those words for Otherworld Barbara. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was. I read. A, I I got a copy of this when it uh, when it first when it first came out a couple months ago, and I and I wrote about it briefly for the AV Club. And uh, um, after I'd finished it, I you know I was looking up. I was you know writing about it, and I was looking up any information I could find about it. And uh, I was really surprised to see that this was a, a much more recent work than the the other stuff of hers that. Um, that Fanographics has, has published. I think this was published between 2002 and 2005, it looks like. Right, and, yes. The, published in Flowers Magazine. Yeah, and uh, The Heart of Thomas that, that you were talking about was published in you know, 1973 to 1975. And, mm. and then um, I guess Matt Thorne, who, who uh, translated The Heart of Thomas and who translated this, um, you know, his the, – the anthology that Fanographics put out, A Drunken Dream, is – it features some some recent stuff, but it's mostly made up of stuff from the seventies and and eighties, and right. so um, so I was really surprised to to see that that this was was so much more recent than uh, than uh, most of the other stuff we've we've seen from her. But um, yeah. now you mentioned the translator. We we neglected to mention that uh, uh, Zach Davison, who is who's translated quite a number of things that we've discussed on this manga series, is the one who translated Queen Emeraldus. And you're right, Matt Thorne translated Otherworld Barbara. However, I think Matt Thorne is a female. Yes, as you were saying that, I just realized that I made a mistake. Yeah, that I, I deeply, deeply apologize for that. She is um, a woman. I that was uh, I should not have made the mistake. But thank you for pointing that out. I do appreciate that. Yeah, well, it you know it, it it's it sounds like a masculine name, of course, Matt. Yes. Um, and uh, I didn't realize that it was female or that Matt Thorne was female until. I opened up Otherworld Barbara and saw a brief bio of the translator, and it mm-hmm. referred to her as she. So, well, well she uh, she might have come out. Uh, she's, from what I understand, a masculine presenting um, transgender woman. Um, but okay. I don't, th- I don't think that she was. Uh, she was out until last year, or maybe the year before. Um, or she might have been, and I was just wasn't aware of it. But yeah, she is um, a trans woman, and um, that is why her name is Matt. Okay, um, and but you know, yes, really, that's 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 neither here nor there. Um, but well, uh, I, I, she, I did I did know that, and I I did oh, I did okay. make a mistake, which is why I'm I'm appreciative that you <laughs> that you corrected me. Yeah. But uh, no, she's the one who has translated the other Hagio books for Fantagraphics. Now, you mentioned that A Drunken Dream and Other Stories, that collection of shorter pieces, was published by Fantagraphics in 2010. And then The Heart of Thomas by Fantagraphics, the English translation, was published in 2013. And so now this year we get Otherworld Barbara. So I guess slowly but surely we're getting more and more Moto Hagio from Fantagraphics. Yeah, and uh, oh, but I really enjoyed uh, this first volume of, of Other World Barbara, so I, I definitely need to check out uh, the stuff they have published, and I hope they uh, they continue to, to publish more. Okay, so in, in trying to get a sense or to relay a sense of what this first volume of Other World Barbara <laughs> is about, that's going to be a challenge because this is quite a sophisticated story. Uh, Now, that's not to suggest that the other book that we discussed this month, Queen Emeraldus, is not sophisticated, but I think it's a more or less straightforward narrative, whereas Otherworld Barbara has so many twists and turns, there's so many crevices in the narrative that it, at times, in reading this, and in a good way, uh, I, I had to stop and kind of mentally adjust, where am I now in this narrative world? Um, mm-hmm. So basically, what we have here—I don't know if you would call this a, a science, a work of science fiction, a work of mm-hmm. fantasy. It's a combination of these things, right? Mm-hmm. It takes place at a future time in the year 2052, uh, and so basically, what we have is our main character. I guess he's the protagonist, uh, Doctor Tokyo Watari. He's what's called, I think, a dream pilot. Is that what he ref- how he refers to himself? Um. Oh, I can't remember what he calls himself. He's like a he's a uh, a member of the the twenty first century Jungian Institute, I think. <laughs> yeah, and so basically, his job and his skill is to go into the dreams of individuals and there learn more information to try to help. 
either the person who's dreaming or others, right? So one famous case that he was a part of that he mentions two or three times throughout this first volume is the one of um, a serial killer. What was his name? The Hamburger Man? Oh. Who killed uh, a variety of women and then uh, ground yeah. up their their uh, flesh and sold them as hamburgers? I can't remember. Um, yeah. But yeah. it's it's like a particularly horrifying Oh, yeah. Horrifying case that that uh, I guess made him famous that everyone uh, refers to or knows him by. Right. Uh, so um, toward the first part of this book, now this is not how this volume begins, but toward the first part of this book, basically, uh, Doctor Watari is called in to this particular case, uh, a former, um, I guess, mentor of his, Professor uh, Daikoku. Uh, asks him to come in and work with this case. Uh, a young woman, and her name is um, oh, um, what is it? oh Aoba, Aoba, A O B A. Uh, she is in a what seems to be a permanent at the at, at this moment dream state, mm-hmm. right? Uh, she is the child of a couple that. The couple seemed to be victims of a double suicide, and Mm -hmm. when Aoba was found, the authorities were able to determine that Aoba ate parts of both her mother and her father's heart, that in this double suicide, they also took out their hearts, or that it was the mother who actually killed the father took out his heart, and then killed herself, I guess by taking out her own heart. And then Aoba ate of both of the hearts, and at that point she went into a deep sleep where she's dreaming unto this very day, right? Mm -hmm. So it's been a long time that she's been in this state. So Dr. Watari is called in to try to find out what what's going on here, what the situ- what um you know, why is she in this dream state? Why can't they get her to wake up? But then what happens is that Watari finds that the world that he begins to investigate whenever he enters the dream world of Aoba starts to resonate in a familiar way with other things going on in his life. For instance, um, matters with his own estranged son, uh, Korea. Is is that how you pronounce the name of the son, Korea? Uh, Korea? Yeah, I think so. Um. He starts to see connections between his own estranged son and what's going on inside of the dream world of Aoba. And basically, Aoba has created this other region, this realm, this island called Barbara, thus the mm-hmm. title Other World Barbara. But he also realizes in the course of this first volume that his son, when he was younger and felt abandoned and needed – to feel comforted, he escaped to this fantasy world that he he said that he created called Barbara. And so the similarities there are, are very uncanny, but there are a variety of these kind of similarities, these connections that Watari starts to notice as he investigates this dream world of Aoba that becomes quite spooky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you mentioned that it's, it is kind of this confluence of both science fiction and fantasy and and um i think for some people their kind of point of reference for for uh dreams and movies about kind of going into dreams is going to be like inception but for me the this book really reminded me of uh, ursula Kayla Gwynn's novel the lathe of heaven which is all about you know this guy who can dream and his dreams you know change reality and um the way that that Lequin tells that story in particular the way that character you know will wake up to find slight details missing or you know little things are getting ever weirder um, in these very minuscule ways um, really reminded me of of the way that that Hagio tells this particular story and and obviously the the dream thing but like you mentioned there's there's more and more of these weird connections between these different uh, plot elements and she keeps introducing these small the little moments and details that that just make it weirder and weirder and weirder. You know, at um, there's a, a another character who shows a pathway who's introduced to is this kind of uh, German minister who is oh, Sarah um, Johan. Yeah, who's Tokyo's um, 
ex-wives kind of object of affection and and he kind of disappears for a while and then he shows up later as this as this person who founded an orphanage and this person from the orphanage um shows up uh, mistake thinking that he and uh Kuraya are are like test tube babies who grew up together and uh, so Hagio is constantly introducing these things that make her make this already weird story even even weirder <laughs> That's right. And at what point in the story, Watare feels that Sarah Johan, who, as you mentioned, is a guy, a priest, who has the affection of his ex-wife, may also be um, the – what is it? I guess the grandfather of Aoba, mm-hmm. right? Um, Ezra, right. who has gone missing – and no one knows what's happened to this this grandfather Ezra, um, but then Watare feels that it might be because he takes an image of Ezra and uses software to age him, and says, "Oh my God, this is Sarah Johan mm-hmm. from Greenholm." Now mm-hmm. we don't know if this is the case or not, but there are these little connections that seem to crop up throughout this narrative that does become quite dizzying after a while. I mean, when you get into this book, it's you're right in mentioning Inception, and like you, I couldn't help but think of Inception, but it's a different kind of story. It does mm-hmm. deal with the delving into dream worlds, but whereas with Inception, there were, let's say, multiple levels of dreaming, right, where mm-hmm. you would go from one dream into another dream into another dream into another dream. Uh, here, we don't really have that kind of leveling. It's mm-hmm. just a matter of mass coincidence. Mm-hmm. There is, um, rather than kind of going deeper and deeper into this this dreamscape and like kind of um, forcing the viewer to maybe question which of these things is reality um, and how you kind of delineate the reality from dreaming, there's an element of that here where it's kind of a convergence of the dreamscape and the, the realscape until they are kind of overlaid on top of one another. Um, but it, 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 it does occur um, in, a, in a very, very different way um, in, in other world barber that does in, in Inception or, uh, or Dreamscape, the movie starring Dennis Quaid. <laughs> Right, and there are, yeah, you know, and there are these uh, intrusions of the real world or reality, if I guess we want to call it that, into the the dreamscape of Aoba. But then there are Aoba's dream world's intrusions into the reality, the real world of Watare and uh, Korea, mm-hmm. and. When those were happening, I was wondering, how, how does this happen? But apparently there's something going on here that I guess that we'll learn in the next volume mm-hmm. that Aoba is able to manipulate to some degree not only the, her own dreamscape, right, this this realm of Barbara, um, but also the ways in which that dream world may connect to the reality of everyone else. Mm-hmm. Well, you say manipulate, but um, it does appear to be more of a <sighs> – I think that describes her too much agency. She seems to be kind of innocently caught up in in something that she can't can't quite control that threatens to uh, to swallow the the real world. Well, I don't know because I mean there is quite a bit of agency going on when she is trying to warn off other characters like you know Watari. Uh, away from what she's doing, right? And yeah, there's a the, the the kind of ghostly version of her that appears in the real world. Um, but then, you know, when you see when Mutari goes into the dream world and, and interacts with her, she seems to have no real sense of of what she's doing. Right. Yeah. That that's that's what's so interesting about this. In that, when Mutari goes into the dream world of Barbara. The younger Aoba, because she is younger in this dream world, uh, she's a little kid, uh, seems to be innocent enough and doesn't seem threatening in any way, right? She doesn't even seem to be threatened by Watari. Mm -hmm. But yet in the – and again, quote-unquote, real world of of everyone else here, uh, especially with the instance of uh, Korea 
And, and again, I, I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name. K-I-R-I-Y-A. You said Karaya? Yeah, I don't. Okay. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Karaya. Just – okay. Let's, let's say Karaya. Um, there's uh, a couple of scenes where Karaya is visited by this spirit, it seems like, uh, mm-hmm. ghost-like presence of Aoba. And so, I mean, that's where I think some of the agency comes in because we do get mm-hmm. a more manipulative, more determined Aoba than we mm-hmm. do in her dream world. Right. There is. There are those scenes where she does seem to be um, fully aware of what she's doing and 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 have complete control over these these powers or or what have you. Um, and so there is that questioning of of who is Aoba and what she's doing and how much of it is she doing on purpose and, and, you know, you know, what, what role does the, does the dreamscape have on, on this? Is it something that is, is being unconsciously shaped or is it something with a, a kind of consciousness of its own? Right. Um, yeah, yeah. In a way, maybe in the way that, um, have you ever seen like Andre Tarkovsky's Solaris, you know, which is about a, a planet that can only communicate by, kind of conjuring uh, phantasms and apparitions from other people's memories. Um, there does seem to be that kind of <sighs> unconscious, maybe shaping of, of reality um, in a way that, that the viewer has to kind of puzzle out that, that they're not fully aware of why this is happening or how it's happening. Um, it's not a, you know, a great, a great comparison, but it does, the way that that it does seem that, that the dream world may have a have a mind of its own does does kind of invoke for me that uh, that movie right and you know this story world that uh, Hagio has created is you know I mentioned that at times it can get dizzying um, it, it does throw you off balance even at the very you know when you're thrown into it for the very first time um, now this is divided into twelve chapters. And the first one, which is appropriately called The World Revolves Around Me, um, we get not uh, anything about Watari and uh, you know his uh, – the people around him in, in that reality, but we get the story of Barbara. And so we don't mm-hmm. know at first that this is a dream world because we see these kids waking up. Um, a, a woman ma- named uh, Maya is making pancakes, which look more like donuts than anything. Uh, and she's waking up Aoba, Taka, and Pine and saying, okay, kids, let's get up. They're, with the, they're sleeping with a goat. Okay, so that's a little weird. But then they start floating, or at least Taka and Pine begin to float. Uh, or levitate, however you want to call that. But Aoba cannot, and so Taka and Pine pick her up. And so, you know, you're wondering what kind of world is this that we're encountering? But then we get to chapter two, which is called Sleeping Beauty Nestles in Sleeping Blood and Roses. And, and that becomes an appropriate title when you read the book. You'll you'll know what I'm referring to here. And I mean, and this is the world of uh, Watari. Right, uh, where he comes in, into contact again with his own mentor, his old mentor, Dekoku, his uh, estranged son, uh, Karaya. Uh, and then we learn that he's been called in to get, go into the dream world of this older Aoba. And then so we learn, ah, okay, so that first chapter is the dream world, and now this is the real world. But then those two worlds start to overlap as the book progresses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, you you said that it was dizzying, and and I agree that it is, and and that's why I think it's really fitting that um, that a character introduces herself as a there's there's a pretty over reference to, reference to uh, last year at Marion Bad the Alain Rene film. You know, even a character the character introduces herself by saying, "Didn't we meet last year in Marion Bad?" And then she goes by the name Marion Bad, um, and uh, it. I think that's a very, very apropos reference because, you know, that, that is a movie that is formally concerned with um, memory and dreams and questioning of, of did something actually happen? How do we know um, without firmly coming down and, and, and saying one way or the other? And, uh, and it does have that similar kind of affect that, that other world Barbara does where, you know, it is, it is, it is dizzying. You're not sure right. what is what is real, what is a dream, what is a flashback, what is actually happening, what is the truth. Um, you know, it's it's told from essentially what I guess in prose you would this would be a 
you know, a third person omniscient um, narrator, but at the same time, it's an unreliable omniscient narrator, um, which I think is, is really interesting. Um, and it, it, it makes for a, a really compelling, curious, I think, story. Right. Yeah, that example that you just brought up of, um, yeah, the character who refers to herself as, what, uh, Myriabad? Yeah, she, you know, that, Tok- I think Tokyo says, well, I've never been to Myriabad, and she says it's a line from a movie, right. and then uh, she well, says person, her name is Myriabad. Right, but th- this this becomes even more convoluted, or another part of the story that becomes quite convoluted, because this is a character named uh, Jujo uh, Nanami, who is also called the Grand Dame, right? So mm-hmm. she is the grandmother of Aoba, who is sleeping, and she has aged. Now, she I, I get the sense that she doesn't have long in life, or she feels she doesn't have long in life, or at least she doesn't have much purpose anymore. And so what she does is she goes to the Jujo Institute, which is linked to her family, um, and uh, allows herself to be used as a test subject to see what the effects of certain, I guess, drugs for immunization purposes will be. Mm-hmm. And at one point in this first volume, when she puts on a suit that is supposed to inject her with these drugs, that's when she goes to sleep and then wakes up as this other character, right? And mm-hmm. she's young again, and she, and when she goes out and she ends up meeting Watari and <laughs> seduces him. Mm-hmm. Um and so I mean what's going on with those drugs what about this institute uh, this Jujo institute and what are they doing what does this have to do with the dreams if any that Aoba is having and mm-hmm. so I mean there are a lot of mysteries that are at least introduced in this first volume that mm-hmm. have me eagerly anticipating the next book mm-hmm. yeah and, and and I think Hagio complicates that even more because you know she is um Nanami is is Aoba's grandmother, and you know, as herself, she um, is a, is a very cold kind of mean, I would say, character. Or yeah. that that is the impression we're supposed to get of her. That that when you know characters interact with her, she is not the most receptive. Um, but you know, then she you know she's not all warm and fuzzy, right? But then she you know she puts on this suit and it makes her young again, and uh, we learn it's only for a temporary amount of time. But she you know, she develops a, a different personality almost, um, that, you know, she, she's interacting with one character and she says, my name's Miriam bad. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she, it's almost as if she becomes this, this character that she has created. And, um, so Hagio introduces, you know, another character who is kind of split, uh, between a, a world of fantasy ostensibly and the real world. And and I like you. I'm I'm curious to see how she plays into this larger narrative of uh, Watari and uh, Naoba and Barbara and the real world. Right. Well, you know, when you mentioned the two sidedness of uh, Nanami, this entire book, this at least this first volume, mm-hmm. um, you know, thematically or I guess a, a more as a motif is doubling. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have the doubling of the real world and the dream world. But in the vast majority of the characters, we also have a kind of doubling going on. Now, you mentioned earlier this character, uh, I think his name is Paris, uh, who comes kind of toward the end of this first volume and is supposedly from the green home, right, that Sarah Johan oversees. But Paris also says that he was this character, Pine, in Barbara, and mm-hmm. so there again. There, there, there's another doubling going on here uh, with Kiraya. At one point, where he puts on a mask, it's almost as if he becomes another character, another person, right? Because he's also a, a very adept fighter mm-hmm. uh, because of training that he's had. So, I mean, throughout this narrative, there are there's this two sidedness, this doubling going on, and it, both in terms of character, but also in terms of narrative space, narrative mm-hmm. world. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that that it is it is a, a book about about doubles and doppelgangers and um, these these two versions of people and of things. And uh, I hadn't really really thought about that very much before. But it's interesting that Hagio kind of structures this 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 world that is almost 
you know, it's, it's literally binary. It is a, it is a, one of two worlds, the real world and the kind of unreal world. Mm-hmm. Um, but her, her ethos seems to be to kind of complicate our understanding of, of that Tunis and to, to point us to the, the fact that we can't ever really be sure of, of which of the two we are looking at or engaging with. It is, it is always in a state of flux or convergence, you know, where, where characters, uh, real selves and unreal selves, shall we say, um, confuse themselves for one another. Um, you know, the the real world and the unreal world converge and overlap, so we can't really see, uh, we can't really discern which is which. Um, and so, you know, you're you're right. I think there is this there is this sense of doubling everything, but it's also a sense of of complicating our understanding of that that doubling and, and of under of of making it difficult for us to to really point out which of the two is which of the two. Right. And, you know, now that we're discussing this, I'm thinking I hadn't originally – well, okay. When we first started talking about Otherworld Barbara, I had mentioned something about the heart of Thomas being you know, strikingly different in tone from Otherworld Barbara. But, you know, one thing that connects these two books thematically – is mm-hmm. doubling is the doppelganger because mm-hmm. the doppelganger becomes a, a central part of the heart of Thomas because the Thomas in the title is a character that by the time the action really begins in the book mm-hmm. uh, has just killed himself uh, a young mm-hmm. kid right and um, uh, soon after we pick up the action. There is another young boy who comes to the school where Thomas had once gone, and he seems to be a striking – he has a striking resemblance to the dead Thomas to where throughout the entire narrative he can't escape being called Thomas or being referred to in some way uh, it, as Thomas or something that Thomas did or what Thomas looked like or what Thomas went to or who he seemed to like. And so there's a lot of doubling going on in that story, especially as it surrounds the title character, Thomas. So there is, yeah, so that is the, the, I guess the scaffolding of the heart of Thomas is built around doppelgangers. Uh, but we have doppelgangers with a vengeance in other world, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that sounds really interesting. It sounds like, um, if you're familiar with uh, Jose Saramago's uh, The Year of the Death of Ricardo Reyes um, or um, Christoph Kieslowski's uh, The Double Life of Veronique. Uh, yeah, that sounds really, really interesting. I hadn't – I don't think I've ever heard that book described to me before. But uh, Or yeah, Mark gotta, Twain's Puddinhead Wilson. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not – yeah, I, I don't know Twain <laughs> as well as you do. but um, <laughs> I'll just, Since we're talking about doubling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, that sounds that sounds like a really interesting book. I've got to get a hold of that sometime. Yeah, it is. Like I said, um, tonally, it's it, it's quite different. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, there are some similarities with the the, the doubling. Yeah, oh, yeah. and uh, that's that's one thing I really like about uh, about doing this podcast and and being able to talk to you about these books is that you you often bring a a very different perspective on things. Uh, and uh, it allows me to realize things or to begin to think through things as we're as we're talking about them, and it uh, I think it, it, it lets me read these books a little better. Mm-hmm. Well, vice versa, my friend. Mm-hmm. I wonder when the next volume of Otherworld Barbara will be released because I'm I'm looking now on Amazon and it's definitely not listed there yet. Mm-hmm. I think I know Matt Thorne. Uh, teaches at a she teaches in japan i think she's a professor of maybe she's actually a professor of, of manga at a university in Tokyo, in not maybe tokyo um in japan and yeah, i follow her on on twitter actually and she i know she tweeted that she needs to finish the translation of the second volume before the fall semester begins so i don't think that's even been completed yet okay oh and by the way there will be two volumes of this okay yeah i just saw so yeah i mean this is one where i mean i know it takes time to to translate these things but uh, i hope they do it sooner rather than later because i want to see how other world barbara turns out yeah i definitely i definitely want to read the rest of the series and in the, in the meantime i can i can read more of moto hagio's work 
That's right. Yeah, pick up a copy of Heart of Thomas and a Drunken Dream and other stories. Yeah, I will. I will be sure to do that. Well, Shay, we discussed two really interesting books for this month. We started off with Leiji Matsumoto's Queen Emeraldus, Volume 1. And then mm-hmm. after that, we looked at the first of what's a planned two-volume uh, series of Otherworld Barbara by Moto Hagio. Good stuff. Yeah, I think this was a, a, a pretty good month. No um, all-killer, no filler, as they say. <laughs> yeah, and you know, we usually don't tease – um, in an episode, what we're going to be doing in the next month, because sometimes our plans are evolving, right, mm-hmm. as we go along. So we may be at the end of one month and still not entirely sure that our plans for that next month will come through. But Shane, I can tell you that for the month of October, we are going to be looking at various horror manga. Mm-hmm. Yes, and there's one book in particular that I am – very glad that we decided to do because I've been <laughs> I've been looking for an excuse to pick up a copy for a while and I am Hell Baby. I am Hell Baby. <laughs> yeah. And of course we're gonna throw in some Jinji Ito in there as well. Of of course. How that could we, we do a, a horror episode that without without touching on, on that guy? <laughs> exactly. And so some of these works are going to be very contemporary, recent publications, but many of them however much we're able to get through, uh, mm-hmm. are going to be older works. And so uh, you know, usually Shay and I look at two recent publications. For October, it's not necessarily going to be the case. Some, mm-hmm. yes, but, but not uh, most. Nope, this, we're going to go to an old, an old classic for, for next month. That's right, old classics plural. <laughs> so yeah, look forward to that, especially if you like horror manga. But in the meantime, you can get great prices on a variety of different manga titles, horror and otherwise, by going to the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. So go to dcbservice.com, and there you're going to find manga at great discounts. You can't beat those prices. We guarantee it. And after you do get your manga there, get in touch with us and let us know what you think about our monthly manga series. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message from the comfort of your own desktop or mobile computing device through SpeakPipe. Or if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, pick up the phone and dial 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. Yeah, and you can email us at twoguys at comicsalternative.com. You can email me specifically at shay at comicsalternative.com. And Derek, if they want to get a hold of you specifically, where can they go? At Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can find us all over social media, such as on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, and on iHeartRadio. And if you're an Android user, on Google Play Music. But you know, you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. A lot of ways for people to contact us. Yeah, soon you guys will have to uh, have to get like a Snapchat. You'll have to start putting this up on Snapchat. Well, actually, we do have a, a Snapchat account. Oh. <laughs> I don't use it, but we do have a <laughs> Snapchat account with the Comics Alternative. But one thing I wanted to mention uh, that I, I neglected to, to say this time around is we just recently have become a part of the Creative Disturbance Network. Do you know about the Creative Disturbance Network? I do not. You are much more up on podcasting than I am. Well, it is based out of your alma mater, University of Texas at Dallas. Oh. Yeah, and it is a collection of podcasts from all over the world, a variety of different languages that bring together different disciplines. And the Comics Alternative this semester was invited to be a part of the Creative Disturbance community. So if you want to find out more about Creative Disturbance, go to creativedisturbance.org. Now, not every one of our shows will be posted there. I think mostly it's going to be our main weekly review shows, uh, but we are carried there now, so check that out. But we will be back next month with some horror manga, and until then, I'm Derek. 
And I'm Shay. See you later.